First of all, thanks to everybody for taking time out of uh, busy schedules to to watch the film and uh, you know uh, in, in a very strange time to watch the film in a in a different kind of way. So we realize that that's a commitment and appreciate it. Can you hear us now, Jamie? Yeah, I took out my earplugs and suddenly everything worked fine. <laughs> so. Um, uh, did you ask me, did, was I going to respond to a particular question, Steve? Well, there was one question in the chat is where does the plant in the Berlin, uh, where does the plant in Berlin get its wood from? I was going to say Jamie was probably, I was going to try to field that question, but Jamie, you living up in that area, I think you'd probably have a better response to that. Yeah, I think it's about 50% from northernmost New Hampshire, Coast County and 50% from Western Maine, because Berlin is very close to the New Hampshire uh, Maine border. And what you do basically is draw about a 75 mile radius around a big plant like that. And so that's roughly half and half. And, and I can assure you that they're not using the kind of uh, gentle logging program, uh, prog uh, you know, techniques that uh, the um, industry is telling us about. They're uh, basically doing liquidation cuts. Uh, I call it vacuum cleaning the forest. So clear cutting plus collecting all of the slash because, you know, everything is valuable to them. So there's a lot of soil depletion that, that goes on in that kind of, um, with those kinds of forestry practices. Well, and when you leave the slash, it, I mean, it's still a disastrous clear cut. When you leave the slash, uh, at least there's some cover on the ground and therefore there's some moisture that's retained, some shade on the soils. When you remove everything, what you've got is a, basically a parched kind of near desert. And particularly in, in a summer like this, uh, I haven't been out in a clear cut in the last month or so, but I bet it's just been a horror show. So soil temperature raises, uh, you know, many, many degrees. Uh, moisture loving animals and soil microbes and all are, are, are really doomed. We have another question uh, from Kathy. Which political candidates oppose biomass in New Hampshire? Kathy, are you talking state, federal? Or maybe we could just respond in general. Both, okay, both. Would any of the panelists like to respond Jerry, to that? Can you, can you, can you take that yeah, in, Jerry? Um, I can't name them all uh, with the third largest legislature in the world. But um, if you go to our website, you can see the candidates that we've endorsed and pretty much all of those have opposed uh, biomass burning. So that's a good list. It's, it's, it's a big list too, but uh, yeah, you can look at that. Well, our, our representative, uh, Annie Custer, is the, uh, I believe, the congressional biomass chairman, which is sort of like the Black Caucus, only it's for bi industrial biomass. So uh, that's not a, a real happy situation. Their, their job is to get the subsidies for these folks. And uh, I, I don't know, most of the Democrats in the New Hampshire legislature were supporting the um, biomass subsidies that were so controversial a couple of years ago. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, a lot of them have walked that back. I think people understand how bad biomass is to the environment and, and a lot of people have come to understand it and changed their opinions on that. Well, I bet you guys deserve a lot of credit for that. Thank you. Hey, this film's done a lot for that too, so. Jerry, I, I have a question for you about that. Um, you know, that's news to me about the walking back because I just don't keep my fingers in every uh, sort of aspect of the biomass industry. You know, we're looking at things internationally as well as on state levels. Um, but it was my understanding, like Jamie said, that still at the federal level, um, Shaheen and Custer were, uh, you know, really still pro-biomass as politicians in Maine and Vermont are on a federal level. 
And it's that question of, just for uh, everybody else that's listening right now, of the argument is always jobs versus, um, you know, so the few logging jobs versus this industry that's really a very dirty industry. Um, so do you have perspective on, on those folks at the federal level? Yeah, um, we're working on them, trying to get them to understand how important it is. That's something that constituents can do also, call both of those legislators and let them know that, that biomass is a bad thing. One of the things that we object to um, is that the subsidies, if we were back into subsidies again, those should go to retrain people in the North Country for jobs that don't involve cutting down trees. The subsidies, when they were going to the biomass burners, those are international companies that own those biomass plants. The vast majority of that money went to companies that aren't even in America, and almost none of it went to the workers. Jerry, thank you. Um, the Burgess plant uh, has probably gotten in excess of $250 million of tax credits, subsidies, ratepayer subsidies over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. And even if, there, even if we gave welfare to the thousand jobs, logging jobs and whatnot, uh, we'd still have a ton of money left over. And we have, in Coas County, we have two paper mills that went down in, in the, you know, from 2006 to 2007. And we still have not recovered. Berlin, where the Burgess biomass plant is, is a ghost town. You come out of City Hall and you across the street are six empty derelict buildings and yet all this you know wealth has been funneled into the berlin area economy and it doesn't trickle down to downtown it goes right out to the the fat cats exactly and i think one of the things that that started this was a long time ago people thought well if you cut down a tree and burn it you plant a new one so it's renewable how bad can that be the problem is that the tree you cut down might be 200 years old. It has 200 years of carbon that's sequestered. If you cut it down and plant a little tiny sapling, it's gonna take 200 years to bring that carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in a tree, if the tree even lasts that long. So you can see you know, the fallacy in that, and that's what was marketed for years, and now people are waking up and saying, that makes no sense, we've got 10 years left to turn this around and we're gonna burn these trees with hundreds of years of sequestered carbon in them. I mean, it, it, now it makes sense as to what we should be doing. And I think uh, things like this are really helping. Also, I have more faith in nature planting a tree than I do in uh, a, a profit uh, motivated human being planting that tree. <laughs> we have a question from Barb who writes that she heats with a pellet stove thinking she was doing a good thing and she's horrified now. Does anyone know the source of wood for the Jaffrey, New Hampshire plant? And she asks, am I understanding this correctly that I should be using my propane furnace instead? I, I don't know the source, but as Jamie said, normally 75 miles is as far as you can go. Really 60 is probably good if you exceed that distance then you spend more money, more energy and diesel fuel than you get out of the wood. Again, that can only be done if it's subsidized. But, um, you know, the cheapest way to heat a house in New Hampshire is with a heat pump. It's cheaper than any other way. And with solar, it's even cheaper. But just off the grid with a heat pump is the cheapest way outside of with solar and a heat pump that you heat, heat your house. It's cheaper than buying those pellets and running a wood stove. I'll, I'll speak to that issue too, Barb. Um, I mean, it's a common kind of reaction, especially in New England, where so many of us use, use wood as cordwood or pellets, um, as supplementary heat, um, as a sole source of heat in residential kind of uses. And, um, you know, people have been doing that for a century. <laughs> um, and, so yeah, there are better things. I think there may be some financial ob obstacles for some people to investing in uh, heat pumps or other more advanced technologies now. So that's, the film is really not about residential use. It's really about industrial use of wood. So, you know, the, think, of, think of all of the 
the people that are eating with with wood in New Hampshire and other northern New England states. And then, um, you know, if you compare that to the amount of wood that's going into just the one plant in Berlin uh, at 75 megawatts, it's just a whole different scale of operation. So, you know, don't beat yourself up about that. Um, Instead, take the, the, that energy and focus it on trying to stop the industry from using wood in a, in a big way like that. And to answer the second part of your question, I live down in the Jaffrey, in the Monadnock region in Chesterfield. And I think that wood is probably coming from right around here. Some of it, I think, is probably coming from Pisgah State Park, which is in the town of Chesterfield, Hinsdale, and Winchester, where the state is doing clear cuts in the state park. There was a timber walk there yesterday for the next cut. Um, there's groups of people in town who are trying to stop cutting uh, in state parks. It happens in other state parks and forests in New Hampshire as well. Um, and it's just a travesty, we think. Uh, if you don't know about Pisgah, it's the largest state park in the state of New Hampshire. It's 13,000 acres. It's undeveloped. It's a kind of a wilderness park. And the state has decided about seven or eight years ago that they were just going to turn it into their, to a source for, for wood um, and started doing these cuts. And it's really flying under the radar still. Uh, Chris, um, the, uh, in Massachusetts, I think there's a, an initiative to uh, stop logging on the state public lands. And I believe I heard recently in Connecticut that they may be stopping logging on a third of the public lands. Uh, given the climate crisis, that should really be a, a kind of a conservation community no-brainer. Stop this multiple use on public lands and put it to the really great use that it can. Allow these forests to keep growing older and older. The older they get, the more carbon that they have stored and also the more ability they have to pull carbon out of the atmosphere that, that can then be brought down into the bowl of the tree and eventually into the soils. So the, the, the most valuable forest product we have right now is wilderness, unmanaged land that is uh, helping to rescue us from our folly, our atmospheric follies. Also, one other thing about the difference between these biomass plants, which are generating electricity at a grotesquely inefficient rate, roughly 25% efficiency, which means three out of every four truckloads are essentially going to waste of, of the chips that are delivered to, the, to these uh, plants. Um, an efficient wood heating system can utilize roughly three quarters of, of the energy. So there's much, much less waste. I'm not saying it's a perfect solution, but clearly if we're going to be burning wood, we should be using it for heating rather than for electricity only, which is a, a, a seriously you know, incompetent and inefficient way to do business. So one question I have is what energy policy should New Hampshire adopt that would take carbon and climate into consideration or what policies? Well, I'll, I'll keep going on that one. Um, basically, I, I think we need to start with how do we reduce? How do we reduce our emissions and how do we pull emitted carbon out of the atmosphere? Because even if we just sort of level off on emissions, we've still got a real problem, 417 parts per million as of June uh, in the uh, atmosphere. And we need to get down to 350 or, or lower even if we can. So we, so we want to stop causing the problem, but we also need to pull back from the problem. So conservation, energy avoidance. Do we really need to manufacture plastics and most of the other junk that you encounter in Walmart? A, a simpler living style. And then after we address that, then we can talk about new sources of, of generation. But if we reduce, th that's the way we can shut down some of these, these bad plants. Thank you. The other thing too, I think if the state wants to be involved in, in energy, um, trying to advocate for 
Granite Bridge Pipeline that was just, uh, the proposal was just withdrawn, but that was on the books until a month or so ago that they would add natural gas throughout Southern New Hampshire. Really bad idea. Um, again, subsidizing biomass burners, another bad idea. Maybe take the money and put it into clean energy. Like I said, cheapest way to heat house in New Hampshire is a heat pump. And if you add solar to that, it gets really, really cheap. So maybe that's what we should be doing and making the transition and walking away from uh, fossil fuels, particularly wood. Are there regulations that the state of New Hampshire has regarding logging practices or are they under review? Most of the regulations deal with um, riparian zones. And I'm not sure of the exact wording, but I think it's something like you can't cut more than 50% of the forest within say 50 feet of the stream or river. Uh, that's some protection. It's certainly better than clear cutting right up to the shore, the banks, but it's not much. As far as, uh, is it legal to do a 250 acre whole tree harvest? Absolutely. Is it legal to do a, a thousand acre whole tree harvest? As long as you don't run afoul of some of the water quality issues that are not aggressively um, uh, enforced, you can get away with it. So for my purposes, no, there, there is no meaningful regulation of logging practices. And the simplest uh, rule is cut must be less than growth and significantly less if we want to pull, you know, carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, there may not be regulations, but there are smart ways to work in the forest and to still harvest trees. And we, in the, a longer version of the movie, we interviewed, I don't think uh, he was in this particular shorter 30 minute version. We interviewed the former uh, chief forester for four decades in the Quabbin, whose name is Bruce Spencer. He's since retired. And his philosophy uh, when, when he was working at the Quabbin Reservation, which is a 100,000 acre reserve that surrounds the Quabbin Reservoir, which is the source for Boston's water, was to always keep the forest looking like a forest. So you could cut trees, but you, you kept uneven stands and you didn't clear cut and you didn't use industrial scale machinery in the forest. And they uh, managed to pay for the whole operation with the lumber that they sold. They kept the forest looking like a forest and they had uh, what was deemed, uh, and probably and maybe not anymore, but at that time that he was working there for those decades, Quabbin was deemed one of the cleanest uh, water, urban water sources in the world. So, um, you know, there are other ways to, to uh, conduct logging, to, to get the lumber that we do need, and to, you know, keep trees standing for carbon sequestration and uh, uh, to keep the forest really healthy and, and water quality up. That's really important, Chris. Um, biomass will fetch you a couple of dollars a ton. If you grow trees into quality saw logs, you get premium prices because people want to make furniture out of them, uh, wooden bridges, uh, build uh, low, low income housing, uh, musical instruments. That's where you make the money. But unfortunately, these subsidies to the biomass industry allow the industry to depress stumpage prices and also prevent the development of value added up in communities like mine. And so we get caught in this commodity rut where a landowner pretty much has no option except to go along with this low value uh, scam that benefits global capital, but it destroys local communities. And I would um, recommend that folks in Vermont, in New Hampshire, check out uh, a, a group in Vermont that is, I think, cutting edge for community forestry. It's called Vermont Family 
Secrets, run by David Brin, who was the Addison County Forester for many years. And they are pioneering uh, how a community can protect the community forests and improve all aspects of the community. They value wilderness. They value high value added pr products that, uh, so that you can cut one tree and create 10 jobs instead of uh, 10 trees to create one job, which is kind of the industrial model. And uh, I would love to see New Hampshire family forests develop, but we really need a David Brin to take, uh, to take charge. But check them out. Could you repeat the name of the organization? Because you cut out for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Vermont Family Forests. Uh, and just Google that and uh, uh, VFF, Vermont Family Forests. Uh, fantastic people uh, really looking at the entire ecosystem of forest economics, forest health, community health. Uh, and one thing that I think that the COVID situation has really brought out is the tragedy of so many people not having access, you know, within say 10 to 15 minutes walk of green spaces during this period. And so we really need to be protecting the forest, not just because rich people like to climb mountains, but because everyone benefits from access to a green place. It, it just helps people have a, a healthier, you know, healthier mental health and physical health, as well as a, a, a community place to, to gather. Would other people like to add questions into the chats? In the meantime, I'll add a, a systems perspective question, which is certainly in the uh, opening of the film and later, uh, when I watched the full version, there was the, the role of the European Union as an importer, uh, as, a, as a purchaser of U.S. forests. What role does the international economy play and how can, how is the United States fitting into that? Well, the, the industry is, uh, is pretty much driven and emerged out of uh, harvesting the forests of the southeastern United States. And uh, the company represented in the film in Viva is located, uh, I forget, the DC area or Northern Virginia area near DC. And um, the southeastern US has traditionally been considered the wood basket uh, of the world, uh, one of the major wood baskets. And uh, it was used for decades to sort of fuel the paper industry, which has gone away. So they were looking for something else to do with this wood and somebody clever who saw this error in thinking about uh, considering biomass uh, renewable and the subsidies that were going to be given to it from this rule mistake made in the EU. Uh, that kind of let the, that was the spark that, that started the industry. So it's the forests of the southeastern U.S. which are, um, which are fueling uh, power plants in, in the EU. One in particular, the one that's uh, focused on in the film Drax Power Plant in the UK, the largest wood burning power plant in the world at 3,700 um, megawatts. Um, and they've been, you know, here you've got the, in Viva, the largest pellet producer in the world, providing a high, very high percentage of the fuel to the largest wood burning power plant in the world. And you know, that, that's kind of the foundation of the industry is just two players. And having such a major impact just from two players, if you can imagine the industry growing further, and there's huge pressure right now. Uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, other forests are being cut. Canada is pretty hard hit and is supplying a lot of the wood to Japan. Um, so, you know, the, e the rule in the EU is where a lot of the US and European NGOs have focused their efforts is trying to turn that rule. And there's been progress since the film was made 
uh, in the UK side in that uh, in that plants can no longer be built that that use wood that in the same way that Drax does, but Drax was kind of grandfathered in is, and is still there. Um, there's a group that we worked with that was featured in the film Biofuel Watch, um, who's been very key kind of activist campaigners in the UK to shut down Drax and were really responsible for that change in the rule. But, you know, the industry just will never give up. That's, this is what they do for a living. They're making uh, bucket loads of money a second. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the work of the small NGOs that's trying to stop them. So it's a, it's a typical David and Goliath environmental struggle story. As one of the people in the film said, um, if we get rid of the subsidies, they're going away. And so one of the challenges here in New Hampshire is uh, two years ago, a supplement to the $100 million rate payer subsidy to Burgess that began in 2013 and was supposed to go for 20 years, but got used up in five or six. And so in 2018, they had to pass a supplemental bill so that we ratepayers are now paying another $50 million of subsidies to Burgess. And that will probably only get us through another couple of years. And so then we'll have to do more. Well, it's hard not to turn a profit if somebody's giving you $150 million every uh, 10 or so years. So take, if we can stop Sununu and the legislature from passing laws to force Eversource ratepayers to um, subsidize these characters, uh, they will go away. And then, I mean, I'd love to redirect those kinds of subsidies to rebuild my community and probably your communities too with locally controlled, high value added, low carbon footprint kinds of economic strategies, not this Walmart commodification uh, lunacy that's really destroyed our planet and our communities over the last half century, our lifetime really. Barb asks, um, how can the U.S. get away with not counting the carbon when the trees are cut and burned? Ask Susan Collins. <laughs> mistakes, are, mistakes are made. Uh, policies are written. You know, in, in the beginning, I think it was well intent. You know, people were well intentioned about looking for uh, alternatives to fossil fuel. And you know, this is, this is just a mistake in carbon accounting. And now that it is that way, the industry just doesn't want it to change and they have a huge lobbying on it. So, and they have uh, politicians like Susan Collins, who lives in a very forest rich state where the forest economy has always been a driver in politics. Um, you know, so you're going up against that kind of inertia of uh, a practice that works and trying to change policy is like trying to change any policy. It takes hard work and you have to be persistent and you have to get people out there and writing letters and signing petitions and writing letters to the editor and calling these politicians and calling them out on what's really going on. It may have been a mistake originally, but we correct mistakes when we're operating in good faith. So the film talks about externalities. Could, could one of you explain the concept of externalities, economic and uh, environmental externalities associated with this kind of deforestation? They're basically costs that you incur that you don't pay for. So the classic example would be uh, a mill or a factory uh, dumps toxins into the river and therefore doesn't have to pay the cost of cleaning them up, the river or the air. And um, so instead, the, those costs are passed on to the ecosystem and the public. And so either they don't get cleaned up 
and, and, and degrade our, our communities, or we, the public, have to pony up the money to clean up the mess they made. And of course, that means their profits are greater uh, because we paid part of their uh, cost of production. So the, the, the answer is they should be required to internalize uh, those externalities. They should not be, they should be releasing clean water. That costs more though. Now, now things did change in the 70s with, with the Clean Water Act and all, but we still, we're still putting stuff up in the air. And, and those are, I mean, global warming basically is an externality because society has not challenged the, the cause of the release to pay for the, the cleanup or to, or to pay for the prevention of, of, of the release. We have a question in the chat. When we write or call our officials, where can we suggest that they learn more about this? Are there, we've, we've posted a few, pasted a few websites in here, but are there some others in particular that you might recommend? Anybody on the panel? I imagine there's too many to, to, to list them all, but uh, the Sierra Club alone probably has some good resources, I imagine, Jerry. We do, yeah. And, and like you said, there are too many um, to list. They're just, they're all over the place. If you search um, biomass, uh, you'll find so much information out there now. Okay. Um, this is Chris here. Um, I was just looking back at my notes. There were, um, maybe, maybe Jerry, could you post these in uh, from that one pager? And there, there are, there's a New Hampshire Forest Action Plan, and I have not read it, um, to be truthful, uh, but it, there's another week to comment on it. October 15th is the deadline. And, uh, you know, expressing uh, y your, the point of view that forest biomass isn't an acceptable sort of climate correcting strategy uh, you know, I'd say first skim the document and find out what they do say. But, uh, you know, having that in there as public comment, I think is valuable. And do you have the link, Jerry? Did you find that? I just pasted it in. Uh, okay, beautiful. And the other one is, uh, and I don't know even as much about this one, the Emissions Commission, and uh, it's a, 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 an ad hoc commission led by Senator Tom Sherman in the state of New Hampshire to uh, collect public comment about climate change actions. Same kind of thing. There's a, there's a, uh, the link that we have is to a website, uh, you know, and I'd say send in comments again that uh, express your opinion, if you believe this, that tree cutting and electricity generation using trees, again, is not uh, an appropriate way to address the cl climate crisis. We need to keep the trees standing. They really are, as it was said in the film, the best technology we have for removing carbon from the atmosphere. Okay, I put that link in the so chat too. That's a place to start. I mean, I'll, I'll promote the film website as well, uh, in that we have uh, resources on our website that are that are vetted you know the the amount of information that's out there is huge at this point but if you go to burnedthemovie.com or you just google burned our trees the new coal you'll find the website and on the resources page there are plenty of things to read and we point you also towards the organizations that are uh, profiled in the film so they're you know, there's some key organizations, both on the uh, on the national level, that are sort of key players. And I'd say the Sierra Club is one. I'd say Natural uh, Natural Resources Defense Council is another. You'll find biomass stuff. Uh, they're very active in biomass campaigning. Uh, Biofuel Watch, which is UK based, but also has U.S. office and a presence in Vermont. Um, who am I forgetting? Oh, policy, uh, 
uh, Mary Booth's organization, PFPI, I'm forgetting what the acronym stands for for a minute, but PFPI, she's a key player. She was the PhD scientist in the, who was uh, interviewed in the film and has really lived and breathed biomass uh, for 10 years. She's based in Massachusetts. The Southern Environmental Law Center is another one. Those would all be great organizations and probably the key ones, uh, the key ones to check out. Terrific. So within New England, uh, there have been a few comments from John Warner referencing Maine as an example. Also some resources in Vermont. Um, is it fair to say that New Hampshire is lagging behind some other states in addressing some of these issues? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's definitely true. Uh, we have a problem with employment in the North Country and biomass is one of the solutions, but it, it doesn't have to be. I mean, like I said, we're, we're uh, just putting in huge subsidies that Jamie talked about. And, and when you think about that, that money could go to retraining people so they could work in something other than, you know, cutting logs from biomass. So, and, and not all environmental organizations are on board with opposing biomass or some heavy hitters in the state that, that, um, that support biomass. And you have that to go up against as well. But uh, yeah, I think we're behind, definitely behind where we should be. Gary, I'm maybe a little less tactful than you. Um, the Forest Society has been a major booster of biomass ever since uh, it became an issue in the early 80s. And to my knowledge, they continue to be leading the charge, certainly when there were these uh, uh, subsidy bills in the last couple of years in the legislature, the Forest Society was claiming that this w allowed landowners to practice good forestry because it gave them markets for their low value wood. Um, if you're gonna be a society to protect New Hampshire forests, you have to oppose biomass. There's just no getting around it. And I, I wish that our, our friends at, at the Forest Society would look at the long-term picture and see that it is doing so much more harm to the atmosphere and to the forest and really to a timber dependent community like mine. Downstate, you folks do have some economic diversity, so you have some other options. We're really a forest-based community, but we, we're getting so little value added, and frankly, we're not getting a lot of uh, low-impact recreation and tourism dollars because the state is pumping in ATV money, which is sort of the flip, the, the, the recreation side of biomass, uh, uh, another high-carbon footprint, uh, bad for water quality, uh, uh, all economic eggs in one basket approach to things. And so uh, my, my community is, is dying. And until we get leadership in the state, not just in the conservation community, but throughout the state and, and, and Sierra Club, I take my hat off to you guys. You are always on our side and I really appreciate that, but you're not enough. And um, well, yeah, I mean, what you said about the Forest Society is true. They, um, they support um, biomass to energy and partly because they own an enormous amount of forest land in the state and generate a lot of their income by cutting that forest and selling the logs for the biomass industry. I mean, that's their, that's their revenue stream. That's what they do. Um, another one, and I might as well throw it in, AMC. Uh, the biggest thing that AMC drive, or one of the things they drive a lot of money from is the hut system, which they lease from the Forest Service. And the Forest Service is a big proponent of cutting trees. So they, they uh, support biomass to energy as an organization and it keeps their landlord happy. And, and as long as economics trumps ecology, we are doomed. Absolutely. Barb asks in the chat, she says, good point about the Forest Society 
She distinctly remembers these statements about the need for biomass as economic opportunity. And she asked, can we get them to change their position? Is that a worthwhile endeavor to get lots of people to contact the forest society? Sure, yeah, that's, that's, that's a great idea. Um, like I said, their business model makes it difficult um, for them to back away from it. It's a cash cow. Um, but yeah, I would do that, definitely. And, and there is some new leadership down there in the last couple of years. So perhaps mm -hmm. old bad policies can get reevaluated uh, in the 21st century. But it, we desperately need it because when the Forest Society speaks, the state of New Hampshire listens. It's, it's that simple. Absolutely. And I would just add to Barb, uh, you know, to get lots of people, it's all, it would always be worthwhile, but to get one person is great. And that's what you can do, Barb. You can write that letter. I mean, if, especially if you're, if you're a member, I think it, it matters. Um, so if you're not a member, join and then write them a letter and tell them you're disappointed <laughs> in the policy. But um, uh, it would take a lot of letters to change them. Letters to the editor are, are another way to, uh, you know, express your opinion and maybe to influence other people who just don't really realize that that's the Forest Service, I mean, the Forest Society's policy and what that means. We have just a few minutes left. I do want to encourage you to fill out the event feedback form that I've provided a link to in the chat. A little bit of self-promotion there. Um, what role do public utility commissions play, state commissions, in promoting change within the energy grid system? And you know, again, I'm trying to look at this at a systemic level. I know it's maybe uh, off topic a little bit, but is it related in any way? Uh, Steve, absolutely. Um, the PUC has a mandate, and unfortunately, in New Hampshire, the mandate for the PUC in, in how they work on energy issues, um, reducing carbon and climate change is not a mandate for the PUC. It isn't. So until we make that change and make that something that they have to consider, because now they don't have to, until we can make that change, put that in statute, um, they'll do what we've asked them to do and, and to talk about climate change with them. It's not one of the things that's on the agenda. So we need to make that change and we need to lock it in in statute. And then the PUC would be glad to do that kind of work. They just really can't do it now. The PUC back in 2013, uh, without any, they're unelected. They didn't consult the public and they initiated the original $100 million ratepayer subsidy to Burgess. And then in 2018, the legislature kind of took over the responsibility for dumping another $50 million of ratepayer subsidies on the ratepayers. So the PUC is, un is helping to underwrite this problem. Absolutely. And that's in their, you know, that kind of thing is in their mandate. You know, that's what we need to elect legislators and a governor that will change that, that will write statute that allows the PUC to become interactive with the climate. And until we do that, it's just not something that they can or have to do. Well, Chris, we're gonna give you the last word. We're just about out of time. Any closing comments? Um, just to get, uh, again, a thank you to everybody for uh, coming to the event, for sticking it out through the Q&A. Um, you know, if you're interested in more information, again, I'll just point you to the resources that I did before. If you have questions, I'll even say contact us. We have a contact page on Burn Movie, um, and that's easy to find. And I'd say, you know, even if it's not film related, but something else, send a note and we'll respond and uh, try to get you the information that you want. So thanks again to everybody. And thanks to Jamie and Jerry for chipping in with their perspective on the, in the state here. Well, I love public libraries and the Sierra Club. Thank you all. <laughs> thanks. All right, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you all to our panelists. Thank you to those of you who attended and contributed.
Best of luck. Stay safe. See you soon.